um, apologies for the inconvenience of not being on site today. But as we know, with most things in life, crisis has happens to everybody. So let me introduce myself. My name is Chantal Hen. I am on the board of Tough Love South Africa and I am the chair lady of Tough Love South Africa. I was appointed to the chair two years ago and I've been a part of the organization for just short of four going on five years. So before I start with our presentation, um, I've got my computer screen in front of me. Uh, I just want to let you know briefly what my story is and how I'm going to connect the dots into where I believe neck care and tough love have similar alignments with each other. So about four years ago, I'd gotten involved in a relationship with a troubled soul. A leading corporate exec who was an insurance mogul who actually was instrumental in creating the landscape of insurance in South Africa. He was highly stressed. He was very, very troubled and tormented by the crisis that he had been through as a child as well. Abuse, manipulation, codependency, enabling narcissism. Despite that, I got involved in this relationship. And in the beginning, we don't really know all of these things. And within a couple of months in the relationship, things started to take a turn. A turn in such a case that few of you on this group might understand the word trauma bonding. My feelings for him, my relationship with him had gotten to such a point that I couldn't leave. I stayed stuck in a prison sentence. The abuse, the emotional abuse, the physical abuse got to such a point that in the beginning of the relationship, I spent quite a bit of time in neck care emergency centers, which then changed to government emergency centers, which then changed to staying locked up in my bedroom for fear of him and not getting any help. So effectively, this was my crisis. I was a sample size of one and I had no hope. I had no help. I had nowhere to turn and I had no money, and I had no family, nor friends. By the grace of God, an olive branch was extended to me, and a friend had said, have you heard of tough love? And I said, no, I, what is tough love? I don't, I don't need tough love. I'm the person who needs the help. And she had said, well, my son is an addict, and I go to the support groups. I couldn't understand how a support group who was helping an addict could help a woman who was in crisis, who was in trauma, who was trauma bonded, who was being severely abused. Um, I call them tennis ball eyes because I'm, I'm a tennis player. And if I tell you that regularly, my left eye was the size of a tennis ball, was to put it lightly. I was in a relationship with a man who was a second Dan black belt who was six foot and who weighed 115 kilos. I'm five foot nothing. I weigh 60 kilos and I had no chance against such a, a, a physically strong person. To be choked out once a day was a good day for me. It really was a good day. I decided that I would attend one of these support groups. I was worried about what I was going to pay at the door for entrance fee because I thought I have no more money. My money has gone into the alcohol for this person. My money has gone into the prescription medication for this person. My money has gone into the drugs for this person. How am I just going to get into a support group that is apparently to help people who are struggling with people in addiction? I'm not here for him. I'm here for me. The support group was situated in Glen Vista, and it was headed up by a lady by the name who was then the chair lady, Shirley Bosman. And um, as I had um, as I had entered, I felt very, very scared. I didn't know where to sit. I didn't know what to do. I listened. That was all I could do. I had no energy. I had 
mind fog, brain fog. I didn't know what to do, how to do, where to do it. I started to listen to the stories of everybody around me. And I learned that it wasn't only a support group for people in Christ, struggling with people in addiction. I learned that it was a support group for people in crisis situations. So let me start with what is tough love. 25 years ago, it we began as a result of two parents who were struggling with their children in addiction. Their children were behaving terribly, disobeying rules, destroying the peace in the home, manipulating, putting people in fear and trepidation. So these two parents created a program which is called Tough Love Today. And unfortunately, there is a misnomer about tough love because a lot of people believe that it's about being tough on the people who are misbehaving or it's about being tough on people who are affording unacceptable behavior. This is a misnomer. Tough love is because it's tough on us. It's tough on the people who are experiencing and witnessing their loved ones misbehaving or behaving in an unacceptable manner and who are doing things that are simply unacceptable. Within two to three months in the program, I was still the person in class who was simply listening. I didn't understand what the program was about. What is the program about in Tough Love? So what we learned was, was that the people who were coming to us 25 years ago, they were the people who effectively were parents, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grannies, grandpas, work colleagues, who were in the program because they were trying to cope with watching their loved ones hurting themselves. So how do loved ones hurt themselves? They hurt themselves through drugs, through alcohol, through not taking their prescribed medication um, because of, of mental illness. That is how people lose control of themselves. So when I joined the program, I thought initially, I thought, okay, this program is... I'm coming back. I just want to talk in if it's okay. So this program is about teaching my loved one how to behave properly, teaching my loved one how to mitigate crisis. I was so horribly wrong. After three months, the penny finally dropped, sitting and listening to other members in the group, listening to their crises, listening to their trauma as an example, we had a mother whose daughter was not taking her prescription medication, but was also taking her prescription medication with alcohol. It was causing absolute havoc in the home. Another example of a case study was that we had Hello. a mother and father whose son was taking. Another example was that we had a wife in a marriage with a narcissist who was emotionally abusing. Hello, hmm? tell Leanne, can you kindly mute, please? Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, so Chantel. sitting around all of these people, I sort of felt like a square peg in a round hole because I thought, what am I doing here? Is this for me? The program is for me. The support groups were and are for each of you and any of your patients who might walk through your trauma ward and say, this is my son. He is addicted to crystal meth. Or this is my daughter. She's going through a divorce and she's simply struggling to cope. Or this is my husband. He's an alcoholic and I am on the verge of an absolute shutdown. Crisis is such a broad term. It covers so many things. 
why did the program work for me? In the beginning, it took me a while, three months, to at least understand what I had to do. But when the penny dropped for me, I realized that no matter how much I wanted my loved one to stop abusing me, to stop beating up on me, to stop... Um, to stop drinking, to stop mixing his alcohol with prescription medication, the more I wanted him to change, the worse my situation at home was getting. What the program actually starts off teaching you is that change comes from within and from self first. In the same way that um, an addict, a substance abuser, a substance, a substance user, a narcissist, um, an abuser. In the same way that change has to come from them first, the change had to come from me. So what does our program teach? We receive anyone in a crisis situation. So we work closely with victim support units in and around the country. We work very close with police stations in and around the country. What we would like to do is we would like to work closer with trauma units and hospitals so that people can get referred to us because we are about how do you mitigate and take control of a crisis? Because that's what contrasis is. It is something that has lost its control. It is something that is out of control. It is something where you are newly walking into a situation and you are overwhelmed by an abundance of feelings that you haven't felt before. So what did the program teach me? The support group taught me how to process and walk through my feelings. The support group taught me about the relevance of understanding boundaries, how boundaries are critical for creating healthy relationships, how boundaries are critical for creating a healthy home, how boundaries are critical for creating a healthy office or workspace. Still, I was still struggling with a couple of things. Boundaries, they don't make me feel comfortable. How do I action these boundaries? Where do I start? What do I do? I felt like I was the terrible person for actioning a boundary. So as an example, with my loved one, I was the caregiver, I was the breadwinner, I was the earner, I was paying the school fees, I was paying the food, I was paying the, the bond, I was paying the helper, the gardener, the insurance on the car, the, the car monthly repayments. I was paying everything. In essence, that would have given me by default the right of passage to set the tone and the structure of the rules for a home, what can and can't be done. My partner kept coming home inebriated. My partner kept coming home aggressive to the point of absolute fear, intimidation and trepidation. My support group taught me and guided me that simple things like, you're welcome to come home, but you can only come home sober because it made sense that a sober home is largely a home that could be a lot more peaceful than an unsober home. This was my first boundary that I had to try and action. I was shaking like this when I spoke to my partner. I had to think of a way of how to courage up how to navigate through all of that fear, those first time emotions of what it was that I could do to encourage my partner to be on the same page as me. I sat in front of my partner. I said, it's wonderful to live in a home that is full of love. It's wonderful to sit in a home that is of peace, that is of kindness, that is of a collective conscious, that is walking in the same direction. At the moment, I can see that you are hurting. At the moment, I can see that you are pain, as am I. What do you think of us together creating a home of peace where the children don't see the noise, where the children are not a part of the abuse? Something in that made sense to him. 
because he did agree to not coming home inebriated, that if he was inebriated, he would sleep out. So part of the Tough Love program is we do not abdicate, kicking or forcing our loved ones to the street. We do not. However, if there is agreement in the rules and there has there is infringement on a person's life and safety, which in my case there was, I got the help of the police. With that, within a month, I was able to get my loved one into recovery. It took me three years to get my loved one to admit that he had a problem. It took me three years to finally see the last of physical, emotional, spiritual abuse. It took me three years to get the kids into a safe space where we would wake up and there was no screaming and shouting and smashing of things and broken glass and blue eyes and choking out. But it would never have happened had I not have understand something fundamental that there was help available, that there was a program of people who shared their own stories and who through teaching me about boundaries, teaching me about enabling, teaching me about codependency, teaching me about self-love and self-esteem and self-respect. I don't believe that I would be alive today. And I say this with proof of photos, with a case study that was submitted to the courts that was this thick, to say, to put it politely, evidence, photos, recordings, videos, of the abuse that I had been through, if it was not for my support group who taught me how to process all of my emotions, how to slowly walk through my feelings of crisis, how to realize that there is help, that there is no shame in asking for help, that there are solutions to every problem, and that even if the solutions cannot be seen immediately or even found immediately, that despite that, the love, the care, the support, the guidance that I had every Saturday from a group of 10 people who simply held my hand in itself was a cathartic experience. So with 25 years running, Tough Love noticed that albeit we started as a support group for helping parents of addicted loved ones, we noticed that there was a very thin line between addiction and people who had mental illness. We noticed that a lot of the members and their case studies that were coming through, we noticed that a lot of the the recovery centers, the rehabilitation centers, the doctors who were treating um, the substance abusers and users at the time, a lot of the feedback that we were getting was that the addicts were self-medicating. There was a pain within. They were taking drugs to escape reality. They have self-esteem issues. So if you look, and I use myself as a case study, if you look at me being the trauma-bonded victim, and you look at my partner who is now deceased because he took his life exactly two years ago today. Yes. He also struggled with self-esteem issues. He also struggled with codependency issues. So largely in our programs, we find that the two people are exactly the same but different. With that, we realized that we needed to broaden our program. We needed to provide more content, more support, and more skills so that it wasn't just about the focus of addiction. It wasn't just about um, a wife bringing her husband in because he was in a car crash for, for drinking and driving. It wasn't just about um, a, a father bringing his son in because his son tried to overdose. It wasn't just about those things. It was about people just in crisis. 25 years later, we have people coming to our program who are struggling with being bullied in the workplace. 
we have people in our program who are involved in terribly narcissistic relationships with over 35 groups countrywide. We also have successfully managed to run online groups as well, very much like if you're familiar with Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous, they run online groups every day. We run online groups every Tuesday and every Wednesday, but we do have face-to-face -face support groups running from Monday straight through until Thursday around the country with groups in KZN, with groups in Orange Free State, with groups countrywide. We are set up where we are not educated professionals. Let me place that um, transparently in front of you. What we are is simply trained through our program. So each group consists of two facilitators. We have a group head and we have a second in charge. The group head and the second in charge are both educated through our program where we upskill and teach everyone about listening, compassion, empathy. We never tell anyone in the program what to do. We speak purely from our own experiences. There is no judgment. There is no specific choice of, of directing a person. All we do is we speak as a sample size of one and we speak about what it is that our pain points have been and how it is that we have processed our emotions and gone through what it is that we've experienced. Within our program, as an example, if you are perhaps sitting in this group and you know of someone who has trouble with an addicted loved one, there is a school of thought that addiction is a disease. There is a school of thought that addiction is a choice. We welcome both. We work with both. We deal with both. If, if you are a mother and you believe that addiction is a disease, we are equipped with the knowledge and the guidance and the support to hold your hand and love you through the process. If you are a person who believes that addiction is a choice, we are equipped, we have the knowledge, we will love, guide you, mentor you how to get through the challenges of coping with that. If you're a work colleague and you're being bullied, if you're a work colleague and you have a narcissistic boss, if you are a man and you are in a relationship with a woman who is abusing you and vice versa, we are equipped to provide the support, love, guidance, mentorship to get you through to safer, more peaceful, healthier shores. Our program is not a quick fix. Our support groups don't abdicate that you come for a day and you feel great. We, are, we see with most of our members, most of our patients, that after six months, people start to turn the corner. We don't live in a vacuum. So whilst you might come to us for a narcissistic relationship, whilst you might come to us because you're being abused, whilst you might come to us because your son is in addiction or your husband is an alcoholic, whatever your point of crisis is, whatever the reason may be that you are coming to us, we understand that every morning when you wake up, life happens. So we also understand that as much as you are in pain, you are still experiencing other elements of pain points as well, which is why we encourage our members to stay in our support group programs for at least six months. We are a non-paying support group program, and by that I mean we get donations, we um, supply to the lotto for funding. If any of our members want to submit um, donations, they do that at their own free will. We never ask for money. We do have what we call yearly subscriptions. Um, this does not mean that if you don't pay your yearly subscriptions that you can't come every week to one of our support groups. You can, and in fact, 90% of our members do not pay yearly subscriptions. And when they do come to their weekly meetings, we walk away with little to no donations at all. Forming partnerships with corporate companies, fundraising, um, golf days, bowling days, um, lunch events. This is how we fund our um, organizations. And after 25 years, still running, 
we're not doing a bad job. The funding is needed for things like we've noticed an increase in our online group and their attendance. Obviously, because of COVID restrictions, COVID fear, lockdown, um, gen the general increase in people um, finding the convenience of online um, a lot more accessible than having to get in a car, drive, um, mitigate through traffic, um, get lost on the way, get to the meeting late. So with the increase in online attendance, we have found that a lot of people are struggling with Wi-Fi and data. So what we what we do do is we do afford um, donations back to people where we do pay for um, the shortfall of Wi-Fi or, or their data so that they can click online with us. All of our coordinators and our facilitators in each group try and upskill our members. In other words, we believe in a train the trainer program. Um, because we are a program that is about being responsible for your feelings, understanding and walking through your feelings because there's no way around your feelings but through them, we believe that um, we need to pass on our knowledge, which is why we have as many as 35 groups countrywide. We believe that dealing with emotions is a very, very um, um, heavy um, responsibility to carry. I'm sure as nurses and doctors, at the end of the day, you're not just exhausted from the number of patients that you've seen and being run off your feet. You also feel emotionally drained because it requires listening. It requires thinking. It requires processing. It requires understanding, compassion, objectivity. All of these feelings require constant drilling down in your emotional well-being and having to understand what it is to be in that person's shoes. Now you're dealing with at least 100 people a day. You must be absolutely spent. So with this, we, we are pretty aggressive with training up more people through our program. Whether they choose to start their own groups we have no, or not, we have no problem with that. What we, do have, what we do want is a strong support within the group. So you will also find that a lot of people in our support group are equipped to run a group, read through the training manual, read through um, um, our, our press releases, read through our resource guides, and are able to also um, support, love, and guide our members. So the pillars of our program really are about ensuring that anyone who's in trauma or crisis are able to come into our program and are able to build up an understanding of how to cope with those feelings. We believe that it never gets easier. We don't believe life gets easier. We teach our members how to become stronger. We teach our members that there is a process to walking through trauma and crises. We believe that it is healthy to understand what that process is. And a large part of that process begins with identifying what your feelings are, becoming friends with those feelings, once you become friends with those feelings, should those feelings come back, they feel a lot more familiar. Isn't that? Isn't that true? Once you felt a feeling once, when you feel it again, it suddenly doesn't feel as intense as it used to. We have seen thousands of individuals and families through our program, not just with addiction, not just with abuse, not just with narcissism. We have taught all individuals in our program and all family members, we have taught them about the disease of enabling. We believe that enabling is a disease. We um, teach people to don't do for others what they can do for themselves. We teach people about um, not being in fear of feelings and emotions. 
we teach people about processing things. We teach people about walking through things. We teach people about becoming friends with what pain offers. Our program has seen thousands of happier, healthier, successful individuals and families. We have been on the news, we have been in newspapers, we have been interviewed, we have worked successfully with police, we have got case studies, um, we have got success stories, um, we have an exceptionally aggressive Facebook page and Instagram page. Um, we find that our business is not getting smaller. We find that our business is getting bigger in particular because of COVID. Um, people living in um, dormancy, people struggling with lack of freedom, people struggling with um, restrictions, people struggling to actually cope with being COVID survivors, people struggling to cope with being COVID. So there's been an immense um, peak in our business and inquiries and people come, um, um, people coming through on WhatsApp, on um, um, email and on phone calls. So to summarize what Tough Love is about, we are a support group for people in crisis situations, but we are not a program that's short term. We're not a program that's short term. Short term does not work for us, not our case studies in any event. For us, our program is about the long term, and it particularly is, is about focusing on the end in mind, which is your peace of mind. We want people, families, and individuals, and workplaces to wake up every day in a space of peace. When we wake up in crisis, it becomes a knock-on snowball effect to everybody else around us. We teach in our program wake up with the right mindset. We teach in our program that peace is the, end, is the ultimate goal. Focus with the end in mind. You want a peaceful home. You want a peaceful life. My story in the end, I was walking down a road where it was either going to be my life because I came that close to death or it was going to be his life. Ultimately, he took his life. It doesn't need to ever be that way. I'm invested in this program. I'm passionate about this program. I love this program. I love seeing people be happy and healthy. I know that our program works. I'm a case study of it, as of thousands of people. Did my partner, did I need to lose my partner? Did my partner need to take his life in the end? No, it didn't need to happen like that at all. It happened in the safest place that I thought in the site ward where he had taken his life. We had thought that if he was ever going to lose his life, it probably would have been in the care of our own home. He took his life because he simply had no more legs in him anymore to take another breath to face another day. I had the breath in me. I had the fight in me. I was willing to face another day, but I don't believe I could have done that without the support that I had of my program, without the support of my group. Every day when you're facing patients and you believe and you hear my words that we can help, that we can teach people that peace is a beautiful place to live in. Please reach out to Tough Love. Please consider that Tough Love can be the next port of call after you have counseled them, after you've cared for them, after you've loved them, after you've provided them with a Kleenex tissue and said, I'm so sorry for your pain and trauma. I'm terribly sorry. If you feel like you need to talk to somebody, here is a number for you please consider Tough Love as a name, as a program, as a port of call for help. If there's, thank you very much for your time. If there are any questions, you are welcome to ask me with the approval of Priscilla. Thank you, Chantel. Um, that was quite an inspiring um, talk that you've given us. And you know, it, I'm sure it pulled at many heartstrings. Uh, we are seeing in um, our emergency departments and in the hospital um, a rise in um, suicides and 
other abuse issues. So we quite um, happy to hear that there is some kind of, uh, you know, support system available for these kind of families and patients as well. So thank you very much. Leave. It's a pleasure, Priscilla. Um, I just want to let you all know as well, we, our board consists of um, 11 members, of which two are co-opted in and one is a registered counsellor. We work very closely with our registered counsellors in the case of extreme challenges where we believe that our program is not breaking through. We also, we also have a volunteers group that consists of psychologists, social workers all over the country. We have a WhatsApp group of volunteers who give up their free time, their free support. And if we ever feel as if we are out of our own depth of a particular member, or we see that they are not navigating towards a healthier, peaceful state of being, we do refer them on or we reach out to our volunteers for support and help. I will say this though, a lot of people, new members that have come on board are people that we have been so surprised by. In the beginning, a lot of our, our members were people who simply couldn't afford to get help. As you know, we are an MPO. There was no money to go see psychologists or psychiatrists. And there was a great, need for providing free support groups, free love, free guidance, free mentoring. However, with the chaos that's happening in the world of this horrific pandemic and other things, we're noticing that the demographic has started to change a lot more. We've noticed that people who can actually afford to get help have started to join our program. So what we did was we interviewed them. We did a case study and a survey to understand why are these people who can afford to get help starting to come to us? And out of the survey, we saw, we, we summarized, we, we, we balanced the program and the answers that came out was that it's because our program is about accountability. We hold everybody accountable for how they actually get to that road of peace. So one of my targets was working on seven day goals. We are very vigilant when it comes to Chantel, what is your seven day goal for achieving peace in your home? And one of my seven day goals was to um, one of my seven day goals was to make sure that um, my program, sorry, I'm just opening the window. One of the seven day goals of, of, of my home having peace was that I would ensure that um, he would, I would ensure that he would, so sorry. One of the seven day goals was, was that I would ensure that he would not come home testing positive for alcohol or any drugs. I couldn't stick to that for the first three months. Can you imagine how difficult that was? For some of you, it's probably very easy, but for me, I could not stick to it for the first three months. The minute I started sticking to that little seven day goal, my group started holding me accountable and I started to become stronger with setting other seven day goals. So, where we stand today is we have got a group of people who come to our program and they are complete, they are people that we never expected to see in our program because in the beginning we started off with people who couldn't afford to get help. Now we have people who can afford to get help. What it's showing is that the program and the, the, the boundaries of the program and the structure and the framework of the program is proving that it actually works because people of money or no money are coming to us. And let's also be aware that crisis doesn't discriminate. Crisis is not about who is um, rich, who is, is a lower LSM, who is white, who is black. Pain and trauma does not discriminate. 
addiction does not discriminate, crises does not discriminate. So our groups at the moment, we sit with a, we sit with a sense of pride because we know that, that through word of mouth, the framework of our program has reached families and people who, who can afford to get help, who can see psychologists and, 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 and psychiatrists. So with that in mind, it would be an absolute honor and a privilege to be able to have more support and work with experts such as yourselves so that there could be an open doorway and a two-way road as to you sharing crisis cases with us and us in turn sharing crisis cases back to you. If that makes, if, if that makes sense, we would look to seeking more help because our people at some point would need professional help where they need more um, support. We're not educated professionals. We are loving professionals, kind professionals. We are, we are people who have simply been through the abuse, the crises, the trauma. We understand the framework of our program and our program works. One of the case studies is a mother who um, has a narcissistic husband. She's been up in our program for nine months. She got to a point where she felt strong enough, where she could start seeking different help. And she's now seeing a psychologist who works with us in our framework. And that for me is where I believe um, life should be an open portal of communication where organizations, businesses and programs are working as a collective for the upliftment of community and humanity, as opposed to a very much of an us versus them scenario. Thank you, Shantel. Are there any other questions? Um, I'm going to open the floor. Is there any questions from anybody on the call or in the boardroom? Okay. All right. Th I would like to say thank you to Chantal for sharing with us all the information and also your story. Uh, thank you, Mandy and the ED team, as well as all the unit managers who have joined us this morning. We appreciate uh, your time. And uh, we know now that there is a, a support available, which we will um, refer our patients to should they need it. And thank you, Priscilla, for arranging the CME this morning. We appreciate it. If there's nothing else, uh, we'll close the meeting. Priscilla, do you have anything else that you want to end with? Yes, of course. Uh, no, that's the thing. Thank you. You can close. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a good day ahead and be safe. Goodbye. Goodbye.